out. And uh, today we continue our series, and it's not politics. Uh, listen, also, uh, at the end of the ser- uh, service, we have a- another presentation, so don't rush out when you think it's over. I'll dismiss you like I always do. So stick around for a few minutes. We want to honor our Tongan pastor today. You know, there in this series, we've been talking about issues, controversial issues that, are, that face our culture, that face us. You know, we're part of an organization called the Assemblies of God. The Assemblies of God uh, is, a, is a worldwide organization. We are the largest Pentecostal organization in the world. On any given Sunday around the world, over 73 million people worship in uh, Pentecostal Assembly of God churches around the world. And uh, so that's exciting. Our organization, our, our national website is ag.org, Assemblies of God, ag.org. And uh, we have positions on all of these issues. If you go in there and you search on the search, just look for position papers and you can find a position paper about every area that we face today, if that's something you're interested in. But you know, uh, I've been talking to you about some controversial topics and I'm not doing it to be controversial. Uh, I am nothing but, I'm everything but controversial. Uh, and, And I believe there's value in knowing what God's word says about some of the issues that we are seeing in our culture today. And my conviction, my conviction is very simple. It's that God is real. He created all things and he's revealed truth to guide us in our journey on earth. And, and uh, I believe life is better with Jesus. And I believe that we get better at life when we follow Jesus. So that's why we're doing this. Today we're going to look at gender identity. My message is entitled Gender Matters. You know, the issue of gender identity is being debated at all levels, by all group pe- people groups. You know, we have our legislators that are arguing that. We have our educators. We have people in the medical industry, uh, social commentators, and our, milita- our, our military is currently dealing with issues regarding gender identity. I mean, everyone has an opinion about this topic. This past Thursday, our school board took a stance against issues having to do with gender identity that made the, the state news and probably made national news. Uh, and there's a lot going on on the issue of gender identity. As a matter of fact, it's so popular, it's like a, a storm. It's like a tornado is hitting our country. Uh, you know, it's pushed on every single people group, even way down to our little children in elementary school. Our kids are being bombarded on social media at schools, even inside libraries, promoting issues, gender issues regarding our children. As a matter of fact, if you go to Amazon.com and you look for books about gender identity, you're going to find all kinds of books. And they're going to ask you, what ages? You know what? Three to five, six to 12, teenagers, adults. And there's a lot being written about this issue of gender identity. Let me read to you a couple of of, of, of lines, a couple of things that you're going to find in some of these books. One of the books says, you know, some of the books says, only you know whether you're a boy or a girl. No one can tell you. Another author writes this, some children will realize their true identity is not the gender they were assigned at birth, and they will choose to make a social transition to live as their true gender. Another author says, gender isn't either or, in many cases, it's both and. Now, at the end of your notes, there's some resources that you can check out if you want to do some further reading or you're interested or go to Amazon.com. And a lot of the books you're going to find are, are, are they're both sides. They're both sides of the gender issue. But what I want to do is I want to start off by defining some terms because we throw a lot of terms around uh, and we don't really understand what those terms mean. But you know, and, uh, prior to 1950, uh, there was no issue with this. In other words, you, sex and gender were the same thing. But since 1950, those terms have been separated. Sex is one thing and uh, gender is another thing. And when we're talking about sex, I'm not talking about the act of sex. I'm talking about biology. I'm talking about people either being born male or female. And that's, that's the fact. That's been, that's been true. That's been the understanding. Now, there are a few exceptions, and I don't want to have to get into that, but trust me, there are a few exceptions to people being born male or female. We know biologically that men have an XY chromosomes and females have XX chromosomes. And listen, nothing's going to change that. Nothing will ever reverse that. This is basic biology that all of us learn in eighth grade and in high school. So, for example, my sex is I'm a male, okay? Now, now men, we know that men have different, men and women are different. We have different reproductive organs. We have different hormones that interact in our bodies. We know that men have more testosterone. Females have more estrogen for the most part. And, and these chemicals that flow in our body, they impact our bodies, 
It impacts how we look. It impacts the shape of our bodies, our muscle mass, our hair growth, our voices, and, and many other things. So when we use the term sex, sex simply is a scientific term that defines male and female. You know what? Your sex is either you're a male or you are a female. Now, the other term, gender, refers to what it means to be male and female. You know, gender refers to how people identify. You know, how a person feels inside. Do they feel like a male or do they feel like a female? So in our culture, there is sex and there is gender. And for the vast majority of people, their biological sex and their gender is one and the same. I'm a male and I feel like a male. Or I'm a female and I don't feel like, and I feel like a female. 93%, and if you're following me, you know, it's 93% or more, uh, or more of people born a male feel like a male, and the, same, and the same for those who are born female, they feel like females. But there is a 7% of our population in America, adult population, this is not young people, adult population, there's a conflict within themselves about this. And uh, 7%. In 2012, it was 3.5%. It has doubled in 11 years. Of, that have a problem. People that experience, you know, they have this experience that their, their biological sex and their gender sort of don't jive. It's called, uh, they call it gender dysphoria. Gender dysphoria is a psychological term that describes the distress that some people feel when their internal self, sense of self, doesn't match their biological sex. In other words, this is a very real thing. When gender dysphoria happens, some people choose to embrace their gender identity even when it's in conflict with their biological sex. And when a person does that, if a person does that, we call that transgender. They're transgenders. In other words, sex, they're one thing, but how they feel about themselves, that's another thing. So transgender means there, there's, a, there's, a, there's a dysphoria. There is a, there's a little, not confusion, there's an uncertainty of, about that. Studies estimate that 15 to 17 million, or 7% of the adult U.S. population, identify as transgender. That's a lot of people. So, so transgender is a person who begins to identify how they feel on the inside instead of who they are on the outside. Now, when a transgender person decides to start to make changes to how they live, we say they are in transition. You know, transition can be as simple as coming out and saying, I'm gay or I'm lesbian or taking on a different name, or changing their pronouns. You know, right now, I don't know if you follow this, but there's over 50 pronouns that people want to be called by. And if you call them by the wrong pronoun, they're going to want to fight with you. I'm not going to go there this morning, but just trust me, this is a big issue if you read or if you're in touch with what's going on. And sometimes, you know, people that are in transition, it can manifest itself in how they dress, uh, to actual physical changes, uh, hormonal changes, even surgery to change their sex. And this is more prevalent than what most people know. Now, the question that we ask ourselves is, should adults be able to do that? You know, should children be able to do that? You know, the, the figure I gave you was just adults, 7%. It doesn't, doesn't mention, and by the way, we know that children from ages 7 up to, you know, teenage years, 17, 18 years old, are also, there's a whole bunch of them that are transgender. In other words, they, they're one sex, but they identify inside differently. Now, this has fired up people quite a bit, you know, and, and, and some people are asking, what's going on? Our society is grappling with this. Our society, families are struggling with this. Because listen, there's not one family here today that isn't affected by this. Whether it's your children, your grandchildren, an uncle, a cousin, a mom, a dad, a brother, someone that's close, everybody by this time is affected by this issue. Everybody's struggling with it. So you ask yourself, what's going on? So what I want to do is I want to inform you. I want to inform you about a couple of things. What's going on? And I want to inform you, you know what, how Christians have addressed this. And really, what does the Bible say about this? We know what our society, and, and, and by the way, there's, there is something called out there in the literature called queer theory. Now, I know you're surprised that I use that term, but because, but, you know, I remember when I was growing up, you called somebody queer. That's, those are fighting words. Because queer means odd, strange. And at one time, it was a derogatory term. It was an offensive slur uh, to refer to transgender people. But do you know today, it is the adjective of preference for the gender, transgender community. That is what they call themselves. That is what, you know, that's the umbrella that covers, it used to be transgender, now it's queer. So when I use that word, you know what, I'm not trying to put anybody down. That's how they refer to themselves. 
You know, to them, being queer denotes a sexual or gender identity that does not correspond to established ideas of sexuality and gender, especially heterosexual norms. In other words, you guys that like girls, you're one thing, you know, we're guys that like guys and girls that like girls. Or, you know, you know what's interesting? Some are even identifying not as people, but as animals. Now, I know this is scary, and you might think I'm lying. Go <laughs> look it up. You know, there's, you know, I'm a, I'm a cat, and they dress like a cat. Now, now today, today you're going to hear a lot about the, the gay agenda, or you'll hear a lot about the radical gay agenda. And by the way, uh, the gay agenda, I think it's a, it is a, it is a, a, a term that extreme uh, right people have come up with to describe, you know, what, what the transgender community is doing. But one of the things that we do is that the, uh, the transgender community has been active. They've been active politically. And they have been so active that they have had a lot of influence on governmental policies and laws having to do with the transgender community. For example, in America, same-sex marriages are legal. Civil unions have been legal for a long time. You know, LGBT can now adopt kids. You know what? The recognized sexual orientation is not protected as a civil uh, rights. You know, it's a minority classification. They can participate in the military, and one, one time they were not allowed. You know what, now the history books are reflecting the story of LGBT, which at one time did not. Uh, you know, uh, they have uh, been influential in passing anti-bullying legislation to protect LGBT binders. You know, and uh, they have been very active and very successful. Some have even suggested that they are working hard to recruit heterosexuals into a homosexual lifestyle. And I, I, I'm not sure if I believe that uh, with all of my heart. But my point to you is that they have been very active. And here's what, here's what they write. And if you go online and you look at it and you read about this, you're going to find that this is what they say. There is something out there called queer theory. Now, queer theory is basically a push within our present culture to accept, you know what, homosexuals and transgender lifestyle as natural behavior. This is normal. In other words, you know what, we're born that way. We didn't become that way. We're born that way. We had no control over it. And uh, tough, whether you like it or not, that's how we were born. So what queer theory does is that it rejects clearly defined male and female traits, opting instead for flexibility in gender and promoting the idea that there are many, many genders. They also say that heterosexuality, in other words, you know, guys liking girls and girls liking guys, is not normal. That's not normative, and it shouldn't be seen as normal. That's what it's been for a long time, but it's been that way for a long time because that's how you made it, but it doesn't have to be that way. So what queer theory has attempted to do is to de deconstruct traditional ideas of sexuality and gender. One of the things that they do to have to do that is that they reject divine appointed instructions. That's what makes Christians so mad. They reject what God says. They reject what the Bible says. And, and, and by the way, let me stop and say here, they don't all, not all of them reject what the Bible says. They just interpret it a little different. They have come up with their own manual of sexuality based on their ideas and their preferences. And if you ever try to talk to them about it, they'll fight with you before they even listen to you. You know, and because they think they're right. And they think that you don't have a right to say anything about it. And whether it's in your family, whether it's at your job, if, actually at your job, it's against the law to even discuss it. But they feel that, listen, we're here to stay. We're not going anywhere. You accept us. And if you don't want to, that's tough on you. That is their position. They're very strong about it. And you do anything otherwise, they'll cancel you. You know, Proverbs, uh, the writer of the Proverbs was right in chapter 14 and verse 12 when he said, there is a way that appears to be right, but in the end, it leads to death. So the question I want to address today with you is, how should we respond as Christians? Well, first of all, as I wanted to try to do, you should be informed of what's going on. And uh, don't put your head in the sand like an ostrich and act like it's not there. You know what? And, and just say, you know, I, I'm not going to deal with it. You're going to deal with it because it's, it's impacting you already. So I, I want us as a church to be honest. Have a conversation about this. How should we respond? Well, let me tell you how Christians respond to this issue, to the gender issue. Traditionally, up to this point, there are three Christian responses to the gender issue, three of them. And here's the first one, and if you're following me your notes, it's called the affirming view. The affirming view are Christians who believe that God intentionally created, you know what, it's transgender people, people of same-sex attraction, you know what, God, God, God created them, and you know, they're blessed by God, and their same-sex relationships are blessed by God. 
And the number of believers who take this stance has grown over the last several decades, and there are now several affirming denominations. They'll fly the pride flag. They're ordained uh, uh, lesbian and gay priests and ministers. They marry same-sex people. So they have embraced it. Now, you would say, well, they're wrong. No, they, they don't think they're wrong. Christians who follow this view claim that, the, that all the Bible verses that prohibit sexuality, and I put them there in your notes. I'm not going to go on homosexuality. I, I'm not going to go over them, but they're there. You can read them when you go home. Don't apply to modern gay relationships, they say. In other words, they argue that the biblical authors who were referring to ancient sexual practices or non-consensual encounters and not the loving, monogamous, homosexual relationships that exist today. They say that believers can be a part of a same-sex relationship if they choose to because that desire is made by God and it honors God and no one should see it any other way. That's the affirming view. A lot of churches, a a lot of Christian people embrace that. Now you say, well, they're not my type of, well, they might not be your type of Christians, but they self-describe as Christians and they have allegiance to the Lord Jesus Christ. The other view is, a, the, another view is a made up of Christians who believe a person can be gay as long as they're not acting on their, on their transgender inclinations, their desires. And these Christians hold that, they'll say that same-sex attractions or homosexual orientation is not a sin. But, but acting, in, you know what, as a homosexual and acting on those desires is a sin. And the position of these Christians is that sexual relationships between people of the same sex are wrong, morally wrong. But romantic relationships, they're different, as long as they're celibate. In other words, celibate same-sex partnerships are not necessarily wrong. So what these individuals say is that their sexuality, you know what, can be celebrated and can be recognized, and some Christians do, as long as they are celibate, meaning they are not involved in homosexual sex. Now, proponents of this view say that homosexuality is no different than any other sin. That it's listed among the sins and it's not singled out as the worst one like sometimes you Christ, we Christians do, they say. So they say that every single one of us, this position says every single human being on earth has sexual attractions that fall outside God's design. So what they would say, hey guys, I don't know why you're so critical because guys, you look at women and you lust over them and for you there's no problem with that. And some of you are going out and having affairs and committing adultery and fornication and you see no problem but you know, you judge, you know, you judge them. So, so what they're saying is, look at, like us, they have temptation. As long as they don't give in to those temptations, they're okay. Like, you shouldn't be given into temptation. Because all of this, you know what, is a sin if you give in. But the fact that you like people of the same sex, that's not a problem. You know, the fact that you have a romantic relationship isn't a problem. There are Christians that take this position. By the way, I want to suggest to you that a lot of Christians take this position. And then, of course, the third position that Christians take is that, you know what, that say that same-sex attraction, engaging in homosexual activity, it's a sin. It's wrong. It shouldn't be happening. you got to repent. It's not God's purpose for your life. You know, and, and God can change, and God can save you, and God can transform you. Transform you. And according to this position, you know what, Leviticus and all those scriptures that talk about it, you know what, they say it's wrong. And the act of homosexuality includes the idea of same-sex attraction. So understand the difference. Same-sex attraction is I'm attracted to same-sex. Homosexuality says I'm involved in that lifestyle and I'm having sex. And, And these Christians say, what they say is that it's wrong. It's a sin. Stay away from it. They'll take you to, you know, for example, in Genesis chapter 19, the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. And the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, they say, you know, don't forget, God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah because of their homosexuality. It was out of control. And when you read the story, that is the case. That is what it says. So what they say is that Christians got to leave behind all same sex attractions and follow and honor the Lord and, you know, be a heterosexual. That's it. And by the way, if you're wondering, that is our position here at Living Word. That is how we see it. Now, the question is, so that, that's how Christians respond. But how should we, you know, uh, that's what Christians believe. But how should we respond? Well, let me be very clear. In your following your notes, the proper response, you know what, to transgender issues is always love. Love them. You know, I, I want to say to you, we got to create an environment where people feel love. That doesn't mean we have to agree with everything. But I believe where the church has handled things so wrong is whenever there's a topic or an issue where Christians disagree, we become judgmental, critical, rejecting people we disagree with. We have created an environment where people don't feel, are not welcome, people don't feel safe. And I want to say to you, that's not Christian. 
That's not, that's not the teachings of the Christ that you and I have committed our lives to. I believe that what we got to do with these issues, these and many others, is we got to build bridges so that we can have conversations about these truths. But when we attack and we judge and we beat up and we're hostile and we're angry, all that does, it builds walls. And listen, parents, I don't care if it's with your children, your grandchildren. I don't care who it's with. If you're building walls, you're never going to reach them. They're not going to want to hear what you have to say. When you say, I'm going to pray, you say, I'm praying for you. You're going to say, you you don't need to pray for me. I'm okay. Pray for yourself. You're the one that needs prayer. It's a big issue today. It's a big problem today. You know, as Christians, you know, we got to love. We don't have to agree. And that's the tension right now in the Christian community. Well, Pastor, how should we respond? We got we to gotta be angry. We got to be mad. We got to let them know. No, listen, love them. You accept them. You don't have to approve of them. No, as Christians, when we see members of the LGBT or the transgender community being persecuted, we have the responsibility to act, not to be happy that they're getting beat up, they're getting mistreated. No, no. You know what Jesus said? Jesus said, love your neighbor. It doesn't matter what our neighbor's opinion is on moral or sexual ethics. You know, when Jesus said, love, love your neighbor, you know what? It means all people. That includes the lesbian, the gay, the bisexual, the transgender, the queer, the, all of those terms that they use. Now, we don't condone, we don't approve, but listen, we're against the persecution and the mistreatment of them because they are people and they have dignity. And listen, especially if they're your children and your grandchildren, you don't want anybody mistreating them because of what, how they feel about themselves. We shouldn't excuse violence, injustice, or any behavior that brings them harm. And you know, sometimes I think Christians do. I think sometimes we listen and we watch and we say, well, thank God they deserve that man. Beat them up, you know, drag them, do whatever you want because, you know, they're, they're, that, they're a little bit lower than human. No, that's not the case. They're children of God, created by God, creation of God, created by God, and God loves them, and that's our mission field. But when we see them as our enemy, we're not going to love them. We're not, they're not going to be our mission field. Look at what Jesus said in Luke chapter 6, in verse 35. Jesus said these words. Jesus said, love your enemies, do good to them, uh, lend to them without expecting to get anything back. And then your reward will be great and you will be children of the Most High because he is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. Be merciful just as your Father is merciful. That's a good word. That's what we are as believers of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, transgender youth today are inherently prone you know what, are, are more than regular youth prone to committing suicide. And one of the reasons why the suicide rate is so high among transgender youth is because of the mistreatment and the stigma, you know, how they've been stigmatized in society and how they've been rejected. You know, I don't know if you've been following this argument, you know, Chino Valley on Thursday, they, they made a decision on this issue that they will not, they're going to notify parents of kids that are identifying as other gender than their assigned gender once they know they're going to let the parents know. And there's a, there's a large portion of the community that says we shouldn't be doing that. Schools shouldn't be telling the parents what their kids are doing at school, which is really, I, I think is a ridiculous thing. But, but the argument that they're making is, you know, a lot of those kids, once the parents know, they're going to be kicked out of their homes. You know, once the parents know and family know, they're going to be mistreated. You know, once the parents, and you know, I, sus I, I suspect that is true. I suspect that is going to happen. And I, I'm saying to you, that shouldn't happen. Because we should love them. Listen, this is, these are the latest statistics. Suicide is the second leading cause of death among young people, aged 10 to 24. And lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, you know what? And LGBT youth are significantly at increased risk. Listen to this. Transgender youth are more than four times as likely to attempt suicide than their peers. It is estimated that transgender youth seriously consider suicide each year in the United States and at, and at least one attempt of suicide every 45 seconds. That's sad. Now listen, Christians, we shouldn't be a part of, of adding to the stress and to the anxiety and to the uncertainty and to the hopelessness or whatever's going on in our transgender community. Our job is to offer them hope. You know what? Lighten the load by loving them, not adding to the load. Now, pastor, do you agree with Of course I don't agree. You know what? Of course I, you know what? Of course I, I think there's a better way. You know, our culture today believes and is teaching that if you want to experience life at its fullest, you've got to follow your natural desires. You've got to follow what you, what you naturally feel. 
Our, we're living in a culture today that believes that our internal desires is the compass that should guide our lives. In other words, what I feel inside, what's important. That's what's important. And that's what's happening today. We have a lot of people today that are saying, this is what I feel, this is what I want, this is what I'm going to do. I don't care what anybody, I don't care what God says, I don't care what my parents say, I don't care what, I don't care what anybody, this is what I'm feeling and I'm going to be guided by this compass inside of me and I know I'm born, born a girl but I feel like a boy and that's what I'm going to do. That's what's happening. Now you can, like I said earlier, you can ignore it, you can act like it's not happening but it's happening all around and it's very, very real. Now, I want to, what does the Bible say about this? Now, I, I want to, I just want to give you a perspective, a biblical perspective about sex and gender. Because, you know, when you look at the scriptures, this is what we see from the very beginning. You know what, when you ignore God's plan and you ignore God's design for humanity and you do your own thing and you follow your desires, it's going to create disaster in your life. It's going to create chaos in your life. You know what, with something that offers to make you happier and a better version of yourself, it's going to make you more miserable. That's a reality. So let me show you that in the Bible. Let me, let me try to prove that point, because that's, that's the point I want to get out. We've got to follow God's design. Now, I know, I understand this. I understand that at the end of the day, you know what, people are going to do whatever they want. But as Christians, we should desire to do what God's Word says. We should desire to obey God. And we should desire to help as many people as we can to understand what God says. I feel what I want to tell you today, a lot of people don't know. Look at what it says in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. Let me go back to the beginning. It says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, that's very simple. I want you to understand the power of that moment. You know what? The Bible doesn't say that God took some substance that was already in existence and he began to create. No. You know what? God took from nothing and he made this beautiful world. And what we learn from creation is that God had design in mind. You know, what God had purpose in mind. Now, that truth has caused some tension for our scientists because our scientists want to believe that it all happened by accident. They don't believe in a God. They're doing everything in their power to disprove the existence of God. Yet, our scientists, the more they study creation, the more they realize, man, this is orderly. You know what? There's design. It's not random. It's not an accident. It's precise. It's orderly. And for all of these things to happen in such an orderly way could not have happened randomly, not by happenstance. Someone had to. There had to be some type of design. But they're having a hard time saying it was God. No, they know. They say we recognize, but we won't go as far as saying it's God. It was, some, it was a force. Okay? It was the force. <laughs> but they're realizing that. But as they look at life and how life comes about, they realize that the, uniform, the, the universe is a fine-tuned machine, very precise, amazing. You know, the Bible says that it took God six days. You know what, whether it was six literal days or some people say it was six periods, six, six large periods of time, we don't know. But God did some amazing, the creation is an amazing thing, and God designed it. Look at what it says in verse 3 of Genesis 1. It says, then God said, let there be light, and there was light, and God saw the light, and it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. God called the light day and the darkness he called night. So the evening and the morning were the first day. And, and, and you know, it goes on and it tells us that after creating everything, you know what, on the sixth day that God created human beings. Humans were the culmination of God's creation. They were the, the, the cap of the, the creation of God. But when you read the, 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 the version, the, the story, after every day, the Bible says God would stop and he would reflect. And uh, every day at the end, he would look at it and he would say it was good. But after the sixth day, this is what God says. Look at what it says in verse 31. Then God saw everything that he had made, and indeed it was very good. Not just good, it was very good. So the evening and the morning were the sixth day. It was very good. In the Hebrew, me'od tov, which means spectacular, exceedingly amazing, valuable in estimation. It was beautiful. It was amazing. And what God is declaring is that his creation was perfect. Listen, God would never call something that's broken or flawed perfect. No, he calls it perfect. It was amazing. It was beautiful. And then the Bible tells us that God talks to Adam and Eve after he made them about, and he, and he instructed them. He told them, hey, listen, this is what's good. This is what's bad. This is what is right. This is what is evil. This is what is acceptable. This is what is unacceptable. And what God did is he gave him standards. He goes, this is what I want for my creation. This is what I want for you, my children. 
Because my goal for you is that you be satisfied and fulfilled. My goal for you is that you would experience my blessing upon your life. So God laid down some, some, some instructions, some, some standards, some rules, some guidelines, whatever you want to call them. Now, now, God is not trying to make them miserable. It's not like God saying, listen, guys, I don't want you guys to go out and have too much fun. So listen, I'm going to put all these restrictions in place. I don't want you to get out of hand. So listen, don't do this stuff because I don't want you to be happy people. That's not what God did. God said, listen, I want you to be happy. And there are some things that you will do that if you're not careful will rob you of happiness. So every single command of God was with the purpose of pointing us back to how we were initially designed and the purpose behind it. And that was to experience all the goodness that God had. Now, you say, well, Pastor, if everything was good, as I look around today, it's not all good. And you're right. You know, creation is not what it was, what it was designed to be. You know, God doesn't look around today and say, listen, everything's very good. Not at all. No, no, things were good, but then they got bad. And then they got better new when Jesus Christ came and died on the cross and made available salvation for you and for me. But in chapter 1, verse 26, we have, the, the, story, we have the, the account of the creation of human beings. Notice what it says. It tells us about the creation of mankind. God said, let us make man in our image and after our likeness. So God created man in his own image. In the, in the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. Now, from that verse, I want you to notice a couple of things. First thing I want you to notice, if you're taking notes, write it down. God designed the sexes, and they were male and female. By the way, these are not man-made categories. You know what? This is a God. This is a God-created category. God defined from the very beginning of time. His plan and his purpose and his design. I have made the sexes. I have made male and I have made female. You know, when you go to chapter 2, verse 18, there's a further explanation of that. And it says in verse 18 of chapter 2, And the Lord God said, It's not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper comparable, comparable to him. And the Lord God caused the deep sleep to fall on Adam, and he slept, and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh in its place. And then the rib which the Lord God had taken from man, he made into a woman, and he brought her to the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore a man will leave his father and his mother, be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And they were both naked, the man and his woman, and they were not ashamed. Here's the second thing I want you to notice. Second truth. You know what? God designed for the sexes to be different, yet complementary. And then for them to unite in marriage. A man and a woman. The marriage between a man and a woman. I want you to notice, God didn't take Adam and clone him so that he would have someone identical to him. No, no. God took Adam, and from him he formed someone of the same kind, in the same humanity, but different. He was different than Adam in the way she looked, in her makeup, in her biology. But God's plan was that they would come together, and they would have a beautiful relationship, and that relationship would flourish. So what we're seeing at creation is God saying, here's my design. You're going to be physically different, but together you're going to complement each other. Now, now, I need to be clear here. I'm not saying that you're less of a person if you're not in a relationship or if you're not married. No, I'm just saying that this was God's initial design from the very beginning. Look at verse 28. Then God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. Now, when you see that term, fruitful and multiply, you know what it's talking about. He's telling them, go and have sex and have a family. Have children. And then he says to them, subdue it. You know, the word subdue is a beautiful word, kavesh in the Hebrew. And it means, you know what, take control of it, develop it, be creative. In other words, God says, I'm, I'm, I'm building the basic building block. You guys can make this work whichever way you want. And look at what we've done all these years later, how advanced we've become. Some people ask me, well, Pastor, you think technology is against God? No. God, from the very beginning, says, I want you to take creation, and I want you to make it better. Be creative with it. Look at how creative we have become. I think sometimes to our detriment. Amen. Sometimes it is hurt. I don't know about you, but everybody's worried about this AI. Have you been following this AI thing? Even the developers, the CEOs of the AIs have gone to Congress and said, listen, you guys got to put the brakes on us because this is going to get out of control. Even the uh, CEOs of the company are going to the government saying, listen, let us warn you, it's going to get crazy with this AI, artificial intelligence. You know, and yeah, it, it can get dangerous. It's going to get dangerous. It's going to get crazy. Look at what has happened with the internet and all, the, all that stuff that has happened. But listen, is that against God? No, but like anything else, it could be used for good or it can be used for bad. 
But the third thing I want you to notice, God designed for there to be sexuality, sex between the two sexes. And I want you to notice that God designed the bodies of a man and a woman to be able to have a relationship. God gave man sexual organs perfectly, you know, uh, and the woman sexual organs so that they could, you know what, they could have sex together and they could produce children. And it had to be that way. Now, now, there's a lot of discussion about sex and what is sex for and the purpose of sex. As a matter of fact, next week I'm going to talk to you about sex and try to clarify some of the questions. Don't worry, it's going to be G. They're going to be X-rated. You know, Pastor, should I bring my kids? No, bring your kids. It's going to be G-rated. As a matter of fact, I'm going to encourage you to have discussions with them about it too. They need to know at an early age. But when God created a man, he, he made man with sperm. You know what? He made a woman with the seed and they would be able to come together and form new life. God gave the woman a uterus that would be able to carry a child to birth and eventually give birth. This was God's design. He made them different, but he wanted them to be complementary. And then the Bible says God placed them in the garden and he gave them authority over the earth. And he said, I want you guys to work it. By the way, work is not the curse. It's not part of the curse. It was work before the curse, before they fell. It's beautiful to work. It's fulfilling. There's something very satisfying about being productive with your life. And listen, that's God's design. So one more thing that God desired for his creation. Chapter 2, verse 15 and 17. Then the Lord God took the man, put him in the Garden of Eden to, take, to tend it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you will surely die. So here's the fourth thing I want you to know. God's design for the sexes was they, they would trust God and they would obey God. In other words, God says, Listen, I'm going to give you guys a choice. You're going, to, you're going to have a decision to make every day. Are you going to trust me or not? Are you going to obey me or not? And you know what their response was? Their response one day to God was, listen, we're not going to trust you anymore. We're going to go our way. We're going to do our thing. And we're not going to do what you say because we think we can do better than what you are telling us. And, and God says, that's fine. But the day you do that, you're going to die. So the Bible tells us they chose not to obey God. And the Bible says death came into their life. And you say, well, how did that happen? Well, look at Genesis chapter 3, verse, first four verses. It says, now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field, which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, has God indeed said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Then the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. For God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So all of a sudden, the serpent, Satan, is introduced and he, he tempts Adam and Eve. By the way, they had never experienced temptation. Never, never had this happen in their life. And here's the temptation. You know what the temptation was? It was in the form of a question. And the question was, can you guys trust God? Is God really trustworthy? And what Satan does is he plants a seed in their minds and in their heart that God can be trusted. Basically, the devil tells them, you're not going to die. Come on, don't be so naive. No, you know what's happening. God is trying to withhold something from you. Because if you actually eat from the tree, you're going to become just like him. And he doesn't want that. He's jealous. And here's the point that Satan is making. God's design isn't good for you. Follow your desires. Do your thing. If you want a deeper life, if you want a more satisfying life, you have to do it your way. you got to do what you want. And that was very convincing to Adam and Eve. It was irresistible. And they start thinking, well, what if there is something better out there than what God has offered? By the way, it's the same temptation that we face today. Same struggles we have today. You know, I grew up in the church and I used to think, man, you know, uh, you can't do anything. You can't have any fun. And the world's out there pulling at me. You got to do this. This is where it's at. And I found myself throwing myself into those things only to find myself very disappointed. You know, the world offers a lot. Satan offers a lot, but he delivers very little. You know what? It doesn't work the way he says. And, and that's what happened to Adam and Eve. They, you know what? They gave in. Look at what it says in verse 6. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and she ate, and she also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. Now I want you to picture this. Notice what they experience when they do this. They don't trust God. Verse 7 says, Then the eyes of both of them were open, and they knew what the, that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together, and they made themselves coverings. 
And they heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Then the Lord God called to Adam and he said to him, where are you? And he said, I heard your voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree which I commanded that you should not eat? And then the man said, the woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me of the tree and I ate. And the Lord God said to the woman, what is this that you have done? The woman said, well, the serpent deceived me and I ate. Now, I don't want you to miss it. Don't miss what's happening here. They're in perfect union with God. There's perfect innocence. There's nothing negative in the world. But the moment they distrusted God and invited sin into the world, everything changed. All of a sudden, how they viewed themselves changed. You know, they were innocent. They're no longer innocent. You know what? There was no fear. Now there's fear. You know, they were, they were you know, just happy-go-lucky. Now they're concerned about everything. You know, what that, you know what that is? That was death. There was separation. There was immediate separation from God. And they felt it. So they felt they needed to hide from God. You know, before when God would come, they would run to him. And hey, good morning, what's happening? But now they're experiencing fear, so they hide from God. And even their relationship, their marital relationship suffered. You know, Adam, what you've done? He throws a wife under the bus. God, the woman you gave me. You know, and actually he wasn't complaining about Eve. He was complaining about God. God, you should have given me a better woman. If you would have given me a better woman, that wouldn't have happened. But Eve's the one that did it. I, I think that night Adam slept in the doghouse that night, I think. Don't you? And then he goes to Eve, and her response was, well, the serpent. And she throws the serpent under the bus. But here's the point. Everything changed in that moment. Now there's brokenness. And by the way, since then, brokenness has come to infiltrate our world. You know what? You don't have to go too far. The next generation... The children of Adam and Eve, she had two sons, Cain, Cain and Abel. Cain grows jealous. He kills his brother. You know, in one generation, after sin enters the world, already, you know what, death and destruction and chaos. Ten generations of humanity later, the Bible tells us things were so evil that God describes it this way in Genesis chapter 6, verse 5. Notice what it says. Then the Lord saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was daily, only evil continually. In other words, 10 generations later, all that they were thinking, you know what, continually, yom, you know what, 24-7, 365 is doing bad, doing evil. How can they do bad? You know, they don't care about God, and God brought a flood to destroy them. That's Noah's flood comes afterwards. So here's what I'm telling you. Our culture wants to tell you we've improved on prior generations. No, we haven't. You know what, we have broken desires no matter how normal they seem to us and how accepted they are by people around us. We're still broken. In our culture, you, have, you will not have a hard time finding someone to condone any behavior that you want to do in your life. Go ahead, do it. Makes you happy. That's fine. No problem. Doesn't matter how it affects anybody else. As long as you feel good, you do it. And that's all that matters. Our culture tells us that our desires and what's natural to you is going to lead you to a greater life. You've got to be faithful to yourself. And then I'll tell you what God says. God says that if you want, you better, you want a better life, it's only found in Jesus Christ. Amen. It's found in following God's design. Amen. I'm not talking about religiosity. Listen, I'm like you. I don't like religion. You know what? The organized church sometimes gets on my nerve. I, I, I try to, we have to be organized, but I don't want to be an organized church in that sense. But I'm talking about a relationship with Jesus who died on the cross for your sins. I'm talking about Jesus who knows you, Jesus who created you. If you want to experience life, it's not going to be found inside of you because inside of you are desires that lead to death. But when you have desires for Jesus, you're going to experience life. Amen. That's where it starts. And this relationship with the Lord starts when you say yes to Jesus, when you're honest with God. You know, some of you are here and you say, you know, Vic, what you're saying is true. I, I went out and I threw myself at all this stuff. I think I was going to have fun and I'm miserable. And I'm sort of like beating myself up. How could I have done all this stupid stuff? And you're here today and you say, you know what? I, I, I made a mess and I know I need help. I need Jesus. Listen, you might be here and you might say, I don't fully understand all this God stuff. I don't understand all this Bible stuff. I don't even understand all this Christian stuff. But I sense in my heart, I know God is real. And I know he loves me. And I know there's got to be something better. And all I know is that, you know what, I, I, I haven't been very good and I need help. And you know what you need? You need Jesus. Amen. Let me end by telling you this. Our culture is experimenting with your life. Our culture is experimenting with your kids. 
Our culture doesn't know you. Our culture didn't create you. Our culture could care less about you. Our culture didn't design you. Our culture doesn't know the future, even though they tell you they do. But Jesus, who left his place in heaven to come to earth to die on the cross for our sins, he knows you. He loves you. He created you. He says, I have a plan. I have a better plan than anyone could ever give you. And my prayer is that you would follow God's plan and God's design. And I just laid it out for you. You know, to put him first. You know what? Follow his design. And God will bless you. Can I hear a good amen to that? Amen. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes as every head is bowed and every eye is closed? Father, we thank you that you love us. Lord, I thank you that in our brokenness, you're not put off by that. I thank you for wanting to redeem us from the very things that are the result of our sins. And Lord, I'm amazed that you chase after us, even when we're running away from you in total rebellion. Thank you for dying on the cross for my sins. And Father, today I pray for those who are experiencing gender uh, dysphoria, confusion, and hurt. Lord, would you just reveal to them now that you love them. You don't simply love a future version of them. You love them now. And you want to connect with them. Father, I pray that you would help us to believe that we can make the right choices. And Father, that we can honor you. Father, I pray for those here today, Lord, that are affected and impacted by this theme. And Lord, I've been wondering, what do I do? I pray that something said today would have given them some light, some insight as to what they need to be doing. Father, I ask your blessing upon every family, upon our kids, our grandkids. Lord, we love them. And Lord, even though some of them are making decisions that trouble us and worry us, Lord, help us to love them and share your love and your goodness to them. Father, we pray your blessing today. We do so in Jesus' name. As every head is still bowed and every eye is still closed. If you're here today and you need uh, prayer, I'm going to ask you to stand right where you're at, and I want to pray for you. Now, I, I'm not interpreting that you're standing because you have a problem with dysphoria or any of this, but maybe something else has happened. Or maybe you're facing this issue and you're just like wondering, how do I deal with it? Well, God wants to help you. God wants to strengthen you. So, Father God, I pray for those that have stood, that are here. I pray for those online, Lord, that, Lord, right now are weeping and crying that your spirit is touching their hearts. Father, remind them, God, that they're not rejected by you either. Lord, I know that sometimes we Christians can come off as very condemning and judgmental. And sometimes we even, representing you, we make people feel that. Because I don't like you, God doesn't like you anymore. That's not true. But Father, I just pray that you would touch and do a difference, make a difference. Lord, I pray, God, that uh, those that are in the midst, Lord, of, of, of this, God, that you would do a miracle. And just, Father, just, uh, I'm not sure... Lord, how it's going to happen, but I know that nothing is too hard for you. There might be those among us today, Lord, that haven't given their lives to you. And today they're saying, I want God, I need Jesus. Lord, as they open their hearts to you, fill their hearts. I pray that in the coming days, Lord, they can't sleep as you're, because they're hearing your voice. Lord, they're having thoughts they never had before, divine thoughts, good thoughts. Wonderful ideas that are, that are strange and foreign to them. But God, it's your word to them. Bless your people today. I ask you this in Jesus' name. May God's people say, Amen. You may be seated. Give the Lord a hand clap. Don't leave yet. Amen. You know, in the, in the month of May, uh, our tongue and pastor, uh, Pastor Siu uh, Bawali and his wife Sisi, were ordained into the ministry. And we wanted to honor them today. I'm going to ask Pastor Siu and Sisi to please come up. They are our tongue and pastors. And they're, uh, they're a congregation that meets at 1.30 here at Living Word Come to the church here. And uh, we just want to say congratulations. You're going to look up there. You're going to see some images of your ordination up there. And you'll see them. Pastor C. And C.C. Pauvale. Did I say it right? All right. There they are. Took a picture with you guys there. Amen. It was a beautiful day. And being ordained, uh, some of our uh, family, uh, lays are amazing in the culture, in the, in the Polynesian culture. Beautiful lays. And there they are. And uh, listen, we just wanted to say congratulations. We just wanted to say we're so proud of you. We're so proud that you're part, uh, that we're in association with you in the ministry. And we're praying that God will just put his hand upon you. God will just bless the work of your hands. Amen. God will give you grace. Not only the Tongan community, 
but the Hispanic community, the Anglo community, the, all the communities that were surrounded by. So we just, we just wanted today to take some time and say, we're so proud of you. Congratulations on this. Event. We have some flowers. This is the season. This is heavy, sister, but you're strong. Amen. Amen. You're strong. If you want to put it down, you can put it down. Amen. And uh, we have this little card for you, a little gift for you. We want to celebrate with you. Amen. I'm going to ask the staff and the board, some of the board members that are here, we want to pray for you. And we just want to reaffirm what happened in May as the, the hands of our spiritual leaders were laid on you. And we just want to add to that and just anoint you and ask God's blessing upon your life. Amen. Today. And, uh, could you join me in praying for them today? Amen. Father God, we thank you for the Pawwalis, Pastor Siyu, and Sister Sisi. We thank you, Lord, that one day they responded to the call of God, Lord, to be pastors. And Father, right now, we just thank you for them. We ask that your anointing would be upon them. We pray that you would protect them physically, spiritually, their marriage, their children, their grandchildren. We pray, Lord, that you would bless the work and anoint the work of their hands, Lord, as they share the word of God, the love of Jesus Christ, the gospel, Lord, to the common community, Lord. Father, we pray, God, that you would just uh, make him fruitful in a wonderful way, Lord. Father, we're grateful that he is a part of living word, and Lord, that we can call him, Lord, our co-laborers, our co-pastors here, Lord, a living word. Father, we thank you for them. We ask your blessing upon them. So we do so, Lord, right now, in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. Give the Lord a hand clap. God bless you guys. Listen, if you haven't met the Pawalis, they're amazing people, they're sweet people.